December 1919, the war to end all wars was over, and in Jamaica, the last troops who had left to defend the honor of the British Empire had come home. Jamaicans had returned too from Panama, where they had helped to build the canal. And in Jamaica, as elsewhere, there were changes in the air. We are in the modern age. There are almost a thousand motor cars on our streets. With electric tram lines reaching to Rockport, Papi, and distant Constant Spring. Of course, the only possible place for people of refinement to live is in the hills. Fortunately, household help presents absolutely no problem. There are men in Jamaica who are now wealthy, who 20 years ago had less than a hundred pounds in their pockets. They have made fortunes out of Jamaican soil, growing cane with Jamaican labor. But the Negro has gone only a short way on the path to civilization, even 83 years after emancipation. He's childlike and lacks pride in his work. And it is to be feared that gratitude is not a strong point in his character. As a race, the Negroes have a little poetry in their nature. But the harder they work, the more vigorously they seem to sing. There were the very rich and the very poor. Those who lived in luxury and those who provided it. Sometimes I wonder what the dark people think about life. Sometimes I don't even quite understand the things they say. When cockroach give picnic, him do I invite fowl. Rocks to one on river bottom never feel the sun hot. There were two Jamaicas living in the same land, but in two different worlds. Yet that same year, 1919, there was born in Jamaica a baby girl who would not only help to bring those two worlds closer together, but would give her own people a pride in their culture and a strong sense of their own identity. Sixty years later, she would be known to her fellow Jamaicans as the Honorable Miss Lou. People are always ask me if I'm born in the country. If I was born in the country, and I said, no, I'm born in Kingston, born under the clock, you know. <laughs> when people are born in Kingston, they say, born under the clock. Well, I was born on 40 North Street on a Sunday afternoon, the 7th of September, and Virgo, <laughs> 1919, the 7th of September. I grew up mostly in Kingston and partly in Spanish town, you know. While I was growing up in town, I loved, I, I, I tell you, my mother always told me about the country and the songs and all that. And the, I used to hear the, the, the Jamaican folk songs on the streets all the time, the digging songs. To me, they were always digging up the streets of Kingston. Everywhere, as you go into school, you hear, um, and heavy hill, and I, 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 and
songs by right there. And we would dull through, we would listen to them and so And I was always wondering why we couldn't sing these songs in school. There we were singing, flow gently, sweet afternoon. And we didn't know what was sweet afternoon. <laughs> and my dear, there were them all these strong, lovely songs being sung on the road. Anyhow, my mother, although she was born in, I mean, she lived in Spanish town and lived in Kingston most of her life. She spent the first 11 years of her life in St. Mary, where she was born in St. Mary. And look here, Cynthia, she never forgot the country. She lived in the country all her life. I always say to her, I say, you must have had a very happy childhood in the country. Because she tells you about the rivers, the birds, a lot of the things I know about the country. I used to hear from my mother long before I ever went. The first time I went to the country was when I was 10. Now, my father died when I was 7. And uh, my grandmother, who I loved very much, uh, Mimi, my mother's mother, she died when I was 10. And she was from St. Mary, of course. And she wanted to die in St. Mary. This is the sort of thing, you know. And uh, that was the first time after Mimi died that I know what a dinky mini was. When you get into those moods, you'll find that you would neither be unhappy or you wouldn't be happy, be a bit happy and unhappy. So you see, oh, <laughs> how does that sound to you? Very oh, naturally. Even from then you got, get to understand that this dinky was not a very respectable thing, you know. If you were very respectable, you didn't have dinky minis, because this was, uh, those were the days when if you're black, you're bad, like. <laughs> and anything that was Jamaican was not too good, you know. And because I remember that um, uh, Mimi's uh, uh, brother, in whose house she died, you know, he wasn't too keen on this thing. And he said, well, not in his house, not in his yard, you know. So next door now, they, they, but they, 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 that didn't daunt anybody at all because it was, it, they, they, it was you know, just the, the, the next yard. The, the people just down about them and them had a big dinky man. And this thing went on for eight nights. And this is supposed to cheer up the family of the dead. And the funny thing about it is that everybody went. Even Uncle Tom would not want it in his yard. My mother's a dressmaker now, you know, and she had this, uh, what we call, dressmaking parlor. <laughs> that was, it was a room in the house where she had the machines. <laughs> and there were always some girls learning to sew, you know. But in this dressmaking parlor, my dear, which was a room, uh, everybody, my mother sewed for everybody. Just everybody. And the nice thing about, she, everybody was a lady. The ladies were coming, you know. And there was the food lady. And there was the coal lady. And the hominy lady. <laughs> and the fish lady. And the store lady. <laughs> you know, there's the lady who was uh, to sell in store. And then the, the, the storekeeper lady. And then there was the governor lady. It went to the stage where she was all sew sewing for governor's wives and things like that, you know, and they would have... Would come. But, and the, the, the thing that, that struck me as a child is that ev all these people would meet in this place. And um, Cynthia, the one strong bond between everybody there was this, the language they spoke. They, I mean, some would come in very primsy and you know, so, and, uh, uh, and after a few minutes, everybody was talking the same language. And this was the Jamaican thing, you know, and everybody, and the laughter. And I found that laughter was very, very important to people. But what I really wanted to do was to write. 
gosh, I wanted to write things, and I would write, uh, make, you know, make up all kinds of things, you know, and um, started to write verse too. <laughs> yes, and people, people would say, foolishness, foolishness. Well, when you are, uh, write, write what? But then, 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 if you write, when, when, when you write, Miss Rob, what? Where should I work? The only place you can work with writing is Glena. <laughs> Anyhow, I um, I wanted to write it. Oh, my mother left me so free to write, and this uh, through those years I was able just to turn out things, you know. I, I, all, I, even when I, I was writing, even when I was going to school, you know, I was writing then. But after I left school, and then I would go around and I would take these things that I write, you know, and I'd say them for for, for my friends, because I realized that the, I was writing in a language that was an oral language, you know. Run go watch up the desktop pot. Take up the fire, Fred. Tell Lou to send some seasoning. Miss married turkey dead. The turkey get a party and was trolling about the place. When him and Kate have starving dogs, just fuck up face to face. The turkey tap. The dog, dog, drop him, lick him out and work it. It make a robot bomba dive and pump dump on the turkey. Of course, I started writing first in the standard language about the sun and the sea and things, you know. I run along a road that way lined with trees, singing to the lazy tune of the breeze. And all that, <laughs> very bugoyaga. And then, <laughs> then I, you know, but I didn't feel all this. Miss Maraballo, we have a target to kill the dog. Poor soul. Two man run up there, Baba, that's on the turkey, cool. Poor married, it's a grown and tie and swear her heart top feet. She take what when the turkey cook, she wouldn't touch the meat. The mouth starts sympathize with her, I tell her that she's right. But hear me, I thank God for my belly going buck tonight. For one to make fun to see a bread, make jeans and pop my ties. Talk loud, make blood for lime, I hear her going to eat in style. Them to a half dead cold fast, I put laugh and be a tree fall. So fill my belly way bust the night while I marry she the ball. And I was going on the tram car, and the tram car <laughs> was a market, what we call a market tram, in that that was a tram car that would take the people from, um, to Constant Spring, Papine and all that sort of thing, you know? And the market woman would be on it with their baskets and things. But they only could sit at the back. When I got onto the tram, when I look at the tram car, only the, the, I could only get in the back. So when I climbed in the back, man, because of that, and as I was going on, one um, say, spread out yourself, one dress woman, I come. By this time, I was uh, I, I was really a teenager, you know. <laughs> I was more than fourteen, but I was, uh, was sort of, you know, portly. <laughs> <laughs> Because I was telling you, after my grandmother died, she'd blow a good breeze on me and I started to get sort of fat. Because before that, I was a mark, a mark, a mark, a picnic. Very thin. And my grandmother used to look at my hands and say, I wonder if they will ever grow. And then, <laughs> and then she got, she, she died and everybody said, me, me blow a good breeze, pan babes. Look how she looking well. And then, no. So now this went up to the tram car. This woman said, spread out yourself, one dress woman, I come. That sweet music, and I started to write in my, my brain. I started to make up this thing, and the whole thing, and the whole thing I wrote. It, it within it was the protest of this woman. I mean, this was the only spot that they had, you know, uh, as market people. They were bringing food into town and go around, and yet they had to be. They couldn't dare to go in the front of, of the tram car with their baskets because it, it would be tearing people stuck. You know, they, they just didn't allow them, and yet still now they. Other people could come and push themselves in there. And this was a sort of protest at the time, and I wrote it. But I wrote in the same humorous vein of the thing, the whole thing of, of the woman. Put out yourself the lies. I want this woman to look like, say, she said, the this space, I don't want to poke herself in there. Put out, girl, she not come. No man, no space in your town. We we'll make your food say lies. I put out yourself, the girl. <laughs> you know? Oh, there go. Louise was now a teenager. She had attended St. Simon's and Excelsior Colleges. The world outside Jamaica was changing rapidly in the 1930s, and it was changing just as rapidly at home. New leaders were rising. There was a new consciousness among the people. But Jamaica's culture had not yet been completely accepted. Even in the world of entertainment, there were two theaters. 
the rich, earthy theatre of the people and the refined theatre inspired by abroad. A proper English accent was once the only acceptable one. A friend of ours visited us. He brought a poem and said he found it in his car because he had taken his employer to some function and he left this in his car. And it was a poem marked, written by Louise Bennett. When I read it, it was, I think, King Street Vendor. And I said, but this is terrific. I must be this little girl, as she told me, that she was a student. <laughs> One night, when I was just nearly a little before I left school, Oh. <laughs> I'm going to say that part. <laughs> that part, though, was this man came to, 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 the, to the thing, to, to the end of term performance. And th this man was, was well established in the theatre. He was doing chalk talk. And they used to call him chalk talk covertly. I went to Excelsior College and met her at a breaking up. After the, the show, uh, I got a book, you know, they gave me for outstanding literary something or other. <laughs> and um, I took this book to this man and said, please, to write something in there. And he says, there is something talent. So I, <clears throat> I wrote in the autograph, uh, um, great success to you. You possess great talent. Develop it. <laughs> and sign my name. That's the first meeting of it, Louise. The next thing I know is, one evening I go home and my mother said to me, a man came here and wanted to come and recite at a concert. <laughs> and it was Eric Cooper. <laughs> and I said, I'm not going to the concert. Either. But he came so often and went to my mother so often about this concert that I ended up going, it was a Christmas morning concert, and I went and I recited. And I got my first fee on the stage, one guinea. Oh, what a joy. I got a guinea, <laughs> and then this guinea could I buy shoes. I buy a pair of shoes for 15 shillings and had changed me for the guinea. <laughs> Eric Cogley put on a show, and she was on a show, I think, for the first time. I was on the show, too, and um, I... Uh, uh, her act was to really... You know, people kept calling for encore all the time. And then, uh, after she talk to her, meet her. And um, I was amazed at how um, how shy she was, you know. Uh, she was a young lady at the time and uh, very shy. Uh, so, so different from when she was on stage during the act. Do you know, those days, again, the people thought I was quite crazy and my mother was mad to, to allow me to do all this. I was taking mules and going up into <laughs> into um, a compound town and things, you know, to, 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 to learn more about it, maroons and all that and so When my first visit to, to a maroon town was, was about 40 years ago, you know, and those days it, 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 there was no driving road, you had to go on a mule. I had to ride them and they, they said, we will send mules to convey you and that sort of thing. But then now, I really got interested in all the things. I remember the dinky and all that and I started to, to really go I, um, I went to the country and spent time with, my, with relatives and all that, going around that to, to tea meetings. Got the tea meetings and the songs, all, all the love songs. Darling, don't tell no lie. <laughs> oh, but the lo one I love is, Feel me love, have lie and heart. Feel me love, will never go. When young Louise first took her dialect poems to the Daily Gleaner, nobody was interested in this shy teenager. But later, when her verses were finally published, they were an immediate hit, and circulation of the Sunday paper soared. Some felt Miss Lou deserved much of the credit. And uh, what, what struck me about these poems was that our um, author was able to make the character live so uh, vividly, you, you, uh, I could see Uriah, and when Uriah preach, and um, I could see uh, his family, his people, um, 
uh, gathered around in the church and everybody, uh, that view I preach is my famous poem of hers. And um, uh, in all her poems, uh, the characters are well drawn. In the 40s, the literacy campaign began in Jamaica. Louise had just finished a course in sociology at the Friends College in Highgate, and she was asked to work now in the literacy campaign, Each One, Teach One. She immediately accepted this challenge. She spoke the language of the people. Now she would help the people learn to read and write. My dear, what a took to. I got a lot of, um, I went all around to, um, the countryside now, of doing each one to each one, but I, I, at the same time, collecting folk songs and stories and getting all the rich proverbs and all that, oh, child. When I hear about festival now, I know that the village festivals have been going on for years in Jamaica, you know, a village festival, because in those days there wasn't much of, of entertainment, there wasn't radio, there wasn't um, TV and all that, so people would make their own entertainment, and these festivals were a thing that every holiday, every little time they could get, they would make a festival, and people would be calling me to say, writing me to say, they're having a festival, and they're asking me if I could come and um, judge the, 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 the recitations because they are going to recite some of my poems. And then they say, they are having a, a competition and we'd like you to do that. Then they would say, we have dramatized two of the books. You know, they would take them and not only just recite the poem, but they would dramatize them. And do you know, that was the real reason why I started to, to think I was there judging these drama festivals. But I hadn't, I, I, although I had a natural flair for the theater, I did not, uh, I did not really study drama formally, and that was when I decided to do a formal training in drama. In 1945, Louise was given a scholarship by the British Council to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London, one of the world's most famous theatre schools. Still in her early 20s, Louise set out on her first trip abroad, determined to do her best for her country. I was uh, herded into a room, I went in, and I saw a lot of people going into the room, pure white smile, you know. And I said, I mean, they're going into this room. And, and I said, well, so I just followed them. And I go into this room and here, and we all sat down. And I thought, me, that me one by myself, and they hear them talk and talk, and them look for me strangely and all that. Me not even notice them. Me just look on the paper for the lady had give me a paper the day and said to study a speech. And I studied the shortest speech on it. <laughs> so I just looking on this little speech, you know. And I see a woman come to the door and she says, Numbers, uh, so and so, 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 she got lots of numbers, follow me. So I said, But stop me, now, no number. How oh, this now? So I start get fixed again, you know, you know, into the, then people bring me up and fool me up again, you know. I don't have no number. So I sit down, you know, and she come in. Numbers, no, and she rattle up, and I see some more people gone. And but I get it vexed and vexed, and then the woman came in and she said, number 33, number 33, number... And I don't see nobody move. Hear me, I wonder if it's me, 33. <laughs> and I get up and follow the woman. So the next day I follow, I was on the stage. Stage, you know, fright, you know. Lights, lights on me now. And I hear a voice coming from out of the darkness saying, number 33, uh, please do something for diction. I said, yes, and I, I remember the thing, but the, the, the little short thing, it was a, uh, uh, the shortest speech from season Cleopatra. And I started the speech and it says, you are a, and I was being very, very proper with my diction, you know. I looked straight out and said, you are a funny old gentleman. And I heard everybody say, ho, 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 ho. And they, Afterwards, I heard that I was looking straight at Sir Kenneth Barnes when I said that. <laughs> and he will finish his speech, my dear. And I heard the voice say, um, uh, could you do another? Uh, something for dramatic, uh, with your dram dramatic uh, ability, we'd like to know, dramatic expression. I said, well, I, I didn't study anything for that, but I wonder if I could do something in Jamaican dialect. He said, oh, Jamaica, oh, 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 anyhow, <laughs> he says, oh, well, yes, it's for dramatic. So, my dear, I did one of my verses, now you know the one about Sepu, <laughs> and then he, uh, I heard him say, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho, and then <laughs> I heard the man said again, uh, another, <laughs> you know, so I said, well, um, 
I, I will do a one-man um, court scene. I will be the judge and the jury. I started with this judge. This was something that Lee Gordon used to do. And I used to like it, you know, when I did this thing. Call Matilda Slackness. Matilda Slackness! Matilda Slackness! Calvin Clarke! You know, I was doing everybody well. My dear, when I was finished with that, he says, Thank you, number 33. Oh, 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 oh. Mrs. Uncle. <laughs> when I get back in the room now, I went back straight to get back this little woman and go in my room. I see plenty of them that were in there with Brittle. And we heard them laughing. Everybody start talking to me now, you know. <laughs> you hear me now? You hear me now? <laughs> Anyhow, my child. The woman came back afterwards and she said, Numbers, why don't you rattle off some numbers? You may go home. <laughs> and I hear some of them say, oh, Better luck next time. <laughs> and it don't seem that them didn't pass nothing. And I hear a lady say, Numbers, so and so, <laughs> go home. Numbers 33, 37, something, number, 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 but I know she called 33. Follow me. So when we follow, we got in the car, the lady said, You're passing on a scholarship. You have a scholarship. I said, Lady, I didn't come here for a scholarship. I came up for an audition. Say, what? I said, Yes, I come from Jamaica. And so, ha ha. Turned out, my dear, that this scholarship was for uh, British nationals. And I was no British national. I born in Jamaica. I didn't have no right in that room. It turned out that number 33 had mumps. <laughs> Well, Louise was a sensation at RADA. And Louise, is, as you know, is always a sensation. For example, for her graduation exercise at RADA, she did the part of the nurse in Romeo and Juliet uh, in Jamaican dialect and created quite a sensation, of course. And then one of, you, one of the greatest ambitions of any RADA student was to get a part in a London West End play or get you, know, you must speak on a, a, a BBC radio program. And before the four months, she went and took part in one of these Caribbean Christmas greeting programs. And of course, Louise, always being different, she wrote a dialect poem which she recited. And the, uh, the BBC, the, uh, the overseas service, uh, asked Louise if she would uh, do her own show. They called it Caribbean Carnival. They gave me the Rudolf Steiner Hall, the BBC Variety Orchestra, Ray Jenkins. You know what that is? Mango walk. <laughs> I, I tell him I want that for my signature tune. No, 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 no. And then at that page, the people clap. When they heard Adam Radha, that I had my own BBC program and I didn't even, I mean, I'd only spent about three months at RADA by then. <laughs> so I had, while I'm going to RADA, I'd got the thing that they were, everybody was working for at this school, you know. And another little thing that happened, I can never forget one day now, a girl who had passed out, she got a little part on a BBC show. And uh, the, I've heard um, Sir Kenneth would like to talk to Louise Bennett. And one big thing when Sir Kenneth wants to talk to you, oh, my dear, so this that. And they put me in an elevator and send me to her. And I go to Sir Kenneth and he says to me, um, one of our uh, students would like you to help her with, with, with the West Indian accent, with, you know, from your part of the country, <laughs> of, the, of, the, of, of the world, you know. So I said, yes. Um, he said, so this girl came and I, she said, well, she's got a part in a play and she has to play a Mexican girl. Girl. I said, Mexican girl? I said, but I'm from Jamaica. So said Sir Kenneth, oh, but it's around there. <laughs> but Louise got very homesick. She got homesick, I guess, for the rice and peas and the bami and all the other things. And so she gave up this very successful radio show in London and returned home to Jamaica. And at that time, something new was happening. Some years before that, a group of expatriate um, Living, expatriates living in Jamaica had formed themselves into a group and were putting on pantomimes with familiar English folk stories, Aladdin, uh, Dick Whittington, Bluebeard, and so on. And of course, this was all being done in the traditional English style of pantomime with a lady playing the leading boy and a man playing the dame, etc. And uh, there's one local pantomime, Solidy and the Wicked Bird. This had been produced, but they were all back to the same uh, English type of pantomime and nothing, you know, 
Nothing concrete was happening. Of course, most of the people in the, those pantomimes those times were very white. You know what I mean? The pantomime was a very white pantomime. Granny and myself were the, the entertainers. <laughs> I can always remember a fellow saying, um, Your Majesty, the entertainers have arrived. <laughs> Just a sort of a cockney fellow. It, it, it was quite fun. Herself and myself doing topicalities which I used to write, and she uh, helped too. And then in 1948, uh, a production of Beauty and the Beast was presented with a Jamaican slant. And the next year, I think it was, Louise wrote Bluebeard. And for the theatre in Jamaica, that was a, a theatrical landmark. <laughs> Is passing by, though a wench is passing by, is not she? Is who? Is you? Be true. Mm -hmm. When I say me love me dear, you a dashing cry me dear. You a call him love and dear, is not him? Is who? Are you? Be true. Chanting little miss, God enchanting little miss is not she. Is me, he he, is me. He, he. Lovers love to love. But I'll never forget the first time I got involved in pantomime through Louise. One day I was here and she stopped by, you know, the usual rush. This Navarro, we need a scene for a pantomime. We're doing, you know, Queenie's daughter, and she outlined the story to me. Uh, uh, write it, no? I th I'm sure you can write it. I said, no, Louise, I don't know anything about writing. Lord, man, it would. Then she outlined. She got me so enthusiastic and involved about it. I said, all right, I'll try. So she went away and she came back in the evening. Before she left, I said, why not make this, this dressmaker, Mrs. Mala, prop, you know? And she said, good, all right, go on, go on. He said, coming back because I need the scene. But, sir, and Rosina, why you take so long to come out to me? I beg your pardon, mother. You have a right to beg your pardon, for I know what I am. I a decent, respectable woman. Queenie. Queenie in rarity. You don't remember me? Queenie in rarity. Somehow the name tells a distant bell. And when she came back and read it, she was very impressed about it, you know, and said, oh, this is going to be good. And I did the little pat song, and we shared it between, you know, the song to share between us singing. Well, she took it down to Greta and Henry Fowler, and they read it, and they said, if I would play the part. So she came back, she said, Lord, they like it. They want to know if you will do it. <laughs> what a devil of a spray on your hand, I am, bro. Oh, no, you see me here? You see me here? I'm a living dichotomy. But it is working, my dear, because I'm very, very successful in my dressmaking saloon, my dear. I sew for lots and lots of sobriety. Sobrieties? Lots. <laughs> that sounds like a bad sickness. <laughs> of course, you wouldn't understand the meanings of those words. But in my work, you know, I ask to use a little foreign language. <laughs> Mafia don't you understand the meanings of some of the words, them, you know. But I drop a few here and there. Make them know that I can use them to <laughs> compound as who's you. <laughs> Previously to that, I used to say to Louise, how can you give up a whole Christmas season all Boxing Day to go down? Boy, I could never do that and all the parties and so on. Just... Anyway, she persuaded me and I did it and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And from then I got involved in pantomime and just through Louise. Yeah. Well, Queenie, what can I do for you today? Because I as a very busy day ahead. Lady Chatham is coming for a fitting and she's very, very fussy, very idle scrum. She gets sort of moved to her retort. <laughs> well, you, you, you remember my daughter, Maria? Yes, I reclaim her. Well, she's coming out from England for a day. And I want to be villa flat for me. I want to be suit me up pretty for the occasion. <laughs> is that so? How may I look on this apart? Well, promptly, Queenie, I don't want to seem harsh. And although I would like to help you, I would first have to make an hit depth study of your 
Oh, Chris, you're wrong, Louis. And with all of that, I don't think you would give my saloon any credit at all. Oh, credit? Me no want a credit at all, me no ambra. Me have no money, no me bus, and me have to pay you. No, 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 shame, shame, Queenie. You, you, you misconstrue me. Look, when I design anything, you know, I don't just do it for the remuneration, you know. The artist in me has to be satisfied, aesthetically. I must feel a, a, a sympathico between my customers, I mean my clean arts and my work. And I'm afraid that there's no report between you and me. I'm wrong. Me no want no report about that, you know. All I want is one bigger, bigger source of flat. <laughs> and then after that, the, the, the panther fever got me. And I think a part of it, a great part of it, was Louise's enthusiasm and the excitement of a pantomime. I know people think it is not theater and so forth and so on, but to, to watch it grow. You are there working, and sometimes there's a dearth of idea, and somebody yelled to Louise, Louise, we need a line, we need a song, we need a... And you know she's there ready with something absolutely bang on spot for that situation. She was tremendous that way. And I want to look my best. You are a charming, artistic talent. I should ask to furnish you the basic format. What is that? A girl here? Why is Carsack the queer? Get behind the scream and tigress on your raiment. Rear men, take off your claws. Take off and the claws everything. What a crisis. But soon, Louise. Uh, went back to London again and again she became homesick for her Jamaica and returned to Jamaica via New York. Louise had always loved people. She'd always, you know, love the warmth of people around her. And so she found New York sort of cold and lonely. And one dreary day in September, she was really feeling down in the dumps, downhearted, nobody cared. And to top it all, it was our birthday. I heard the telephone ring. And I ran to the phone, pick it up, and I heard a man's voice saying, very English, I speak, you know, speak is spoken. Miss Louise Bennett. You hear me, Louise Bennett speaking. Louise! <laughs> You're recovering, what you doing here? Eric Cobbley! <laughs> it was an entirely different meeting. We were both grown up then, in 1953. Uh, she was just coming from London, from the BBC. This was my first visit to New York. So, my dear, after this, every time a folk to where Louise, you want to go? That then now, everywhere people would would invite me. They say, bring Mr. Coverley. <laughs> and I got my own invitation. It's to bring Louise Bennett with you. So we got together. Eventually, we found ourselves keeping very late hours, meeting because I had to take her to these things, escort her. You know how it is, and take her home back. And took getting back two and three in the mornings from several dinner parties, functions, etc. Well, eventually, we got a little um, concerned about this thing. Of course, something happened between us then, you know, and we started to notice each other and, and we got very interested in each other. And one night on the train going to Brooklyn, he says, Sierra Louise, I drop asleep every night when I go in back on the train to Manhattan, you know, it looks like I have to marry to you, you know. <laughs> I don't like this business. I drop you in Brooklyn and I have to go back. <laughs> I said, this is the strangest proposal I ever hear in my life. <laughs> I said, come on, you propose it to me. This is on a train, you know. He says, well, it looks like someone just have to marry to you because I drop asleep sometime I pass the stop. You know? <laughs> See here? I thought it was easier, uh, quicker, or cheaper in getting married <laughs> than just good going on two and three in the mornings after taking her home to Brooklyn from New York and me traveling back.
Miss Lou's career spanned the entire spectrum of entertainment. She brought Jamaican folklore to radio listeners in North America, and back home in Jamaica, she played in Shakespeare, giving an inspired performance as Mistress Quickly in The Merry Wives of Windsor. Of course, there were more pantomimes and uh, Louise, somebody, you know, who, is, who, who seems to have enough energy to live three lives all at once. And she, in, about in the mid-50s, she started a very important job. And around about the same time, while she was teaching extramural drama to uh, a lot of different groups, she began this job of drama officer with the Jamaica Social Welfare Commission, a concept which was developed by the late national hero Norman Manley, that in order to really uh, develop our communities, we should understand the business of their indigenous forms of recreation and so on. And so Louise would go to these country villages. This would take her into every little nook and cranny of the island, teaching groups in community centers, in school rooms, in church halls, in churches sometimes, on people's verandas, and lots of times underneath trees. And I think many people realize the tremendous job that did in terms of the whole development of drama and the awareness and participation of, uh, of theater activities in Jamaica. And I had the fortune uh, to be working with her, along with her at the time, on a voluntary basis. She would call me up and ask me to go out with her. And at that time, I wasn't realizing that Louise was trying to find a replacement for herself because she was thinking of moving on to other things. T to date, uh, ever since radio in Jamaica, that is from Z2I come uh, Jamaica Broadcasting Company, now RJR, and now Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation, JBC, um, there has been no show or no radio show as popular as this one. Hi, the Lou and Ready Show. I remember uh, it started just after JBC opened. Um, and I used to be associated in that I used to do the warm-up and I used to conduct the audience, you know, and the laugh and that. And it was a fantabulous experience for me. One thing I like with you, know, Ronnie. What? Because I is a face, man. No matter with that, your face is not your fortune. You know better. If good looks was food, you would be everlastingly hungry. Now your fight is with the run. As we jump into the car, a member said the only suit I have to change into when I take off this suit is my bad suit. <laughs> and it's here. Can you turn the mic a little to the left? One of the longest running radio shows in Jamaica was to be Miss Lou's Views, in which Louise commented tartly on happenings of the day, quoting such imaginary characters as her famous Auntie Rochi. Okay, that's fine. All right, stand by. Right on. Ready for the program now with ID. ID? Oh. Miss Lou's views, Friday, February 9. Okay. Listen up. One big cascas broke out in Auntie Roche yard about strikers, Mrs. Hey! The girl dim dim she gave out say, Lux, what are we a strike artist like a broad in Jamaica nowadays, eh? Aunt Roche about out a laugh and say, Oh no, dim dim. And her uncle nowadays, Jamaica, they not suffer from strikeitis. For years upon years now. Mm -hmm. For when me see the striking nurse, them picture in a newspaper, what they say, with black band round them ways. Me remember so the same same thing was a happen round 1966. Eh? Some of the most popular Miss Lou's views were brought out on a long playing record. By her 60th birthday, she had published no fewer than 10 books among the most recent are Jamaican Labrish, in both hardcover and paperback, now used as a textbook at the University of the West Indies, and a new collection of Anansi stories. I recall our, our, their, their parents with her uh, in England in the 
from Commonwealth Arts Festival in 1965 when she was being, as it were, being thrown to the wolves alone with a, without the benefit of a backup. And she had second thoughts about it. I remember having to telegraph her from the airport to say, please come, we are expecting you. And she came and she joined her poet colleagues in Cardiff, went to the Royal Court in London and again to the Festival Hall and came out with flying collars. And she did because she was one of the few people in the Commonwealth was talking um, in language that was organic to her own people and language which in fact defied the um, Eurocentric dictates of colonial life. And without firing a shot, without being violent, without resorting to polemics, Louise Bennett has been herself a symbol of a kind of cultural revolution in Jamaica and the Caribbean. You see, a lot of our people go to foreign countries and pretend that they have just come to take. And they don't realize that they have brought a rich heritage with them to share with the people there too. And they have a lot to give to the people. And because I've always thought that if, when they talk about language and all that, we can't, we couldn't sing a Jamaican folk song and say, um, this long time girl, I haven't seen you. Come, let me hold your hand. Sometimes, you know, the children come in and say, Come, let me hold your hand. I said to my darling, no, it's come, let me hold your hand. It's free and as it's ours, you know, that's what we say. Because I, I, I've always thought that if people downgrade our language, how is it that, that they, they don't realize that the English language is still a dialect? dialect. It is an international dialect. It, it, I mean, it is that it's known all over the world, and we respect that. But if Chaucer, the man who started to write this thing, had not started to write that. And if Chaucer was to come back now, he wouldn't understand the, how the language has grown. And if he were to talk, they wouldn't understand him, you know? It's the same thing, <laughs> you know? It's growing, and you have to start to do this. As far as I'm concerned, the most unique thing about Louise is what she has done for, for a people, in that she gave them some respectability. Uh, I am very angry that we have not, as a people, accepted it totally, in that um, the language, which is our language, she brought on to us, made us realize that it was our language. We didn't have to pretend to be peel imitations of anybody else. In the first answer, the fourth line, when he says, you know, the car and truck back on me. Yeah, they have a near one day. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's the basic situation. Now, the rhythms are a little unusual, aren't they, for, for Louise? Um, does it seem to you to work very well? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Two, two and a half beats and then a full beat. Yes. And a pace. And then it's, it's sort of tongue tied, sort of a conundrum. Uh, the surprise of all the anguish or the anxiety of the person, you know, uh -huh. and the speed rhythm and all that. So what do you mean by speed rhythm? It's fast up a one. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you can really spoil rather slowly. Uh -huh. It seems to it, it's the confusion. That yeah, but I think, I think that's fast. much more onto it, actually, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you, you asked me why it is we are studying Louise at the university. Well, it, it's a very simple reason. We're studying Louise at university because we think that she's a good poet, a Caribbean poet who belongs on a course in Caribbean literature. And um, we had the opportunity to do this because Jamaica Labrish became available. The Caribbean course, you see, is intended to give the first of the two Caribbean courses, because there's a second now these days. Uh, it's intended to give some sort of introduction to the range of Caribbean literature. It would obviously include a number of authors who write primarily, or I, don't, I can't think of any case where the author writes only in standard English. But it's very important that we also have the outstanding practitioners who are working at the other end of the continuum of language in the Caribbean. And Louise is, of course, 
the outstanding practitioner in dialect in the Caribbean. You know, Carnation Market, they used to call it Duffy Market because it used to be a burial ground, you know, out there. And they say it was white people, they buried out there. <laughs> so anytime they see a white body in you know, the market, they swear it was a Duffy. <laughs> so, and, so I had this thing with him. I tell my child, how are you there? A time for me up yet? Not a dark star, I'm afraid to tell her what it with cold sweat. With that to say your head away, keep by your mouth, the girl train you, I see one what damn white man said that Miss Matty Stahl. Whatever white man are doing at this hour of the night, that the number of stuff in Mrs. Me not dead with fright. Coronation market for food, this year I drew me tongue. But I write it so the duffy man, but for Miss Liza down. And now I see her. Uh, tap tap his love and I put the door, but then I'm not gonna forget her dress down, try. Oh, me have had the new booth me buy yesterday in a one store. The fight is well, me can't know me wanna put no more. <laughs> what does Louise Bennett mean to me? Well, for one thing, she's an ancestral symbol. She's every inch the Earth Mother. She is the matriarch. And Louise, you know, she puts on weight quickly and she sometimes uh, has on too much. And um, uh, the doctor will put her on a diet and say, no chocolate, no ice cream. And Louise will say, not, uh, not even any more chocolate, no ice cream. And then uh, in, during uh, re uh, rehearsal or showtime, um, she would whisper to me and say, go buy a chocolate for me now, or bring ice cream for me now, do a drop it now for ice cream. And she said, Louise, you can't. And she just would go on and have her ice cream. She's a terrific woman, all the woman, an excellent housewife. Apart from her artistic ability, she looks after our house and our family. And that is one of the things that I have had to admire all through her career. As an artist, well, I'm one of our greatest fans. I have found her uh, a wonderful um, a partner in, in the performances. Um, uh, we, we still do a thing together uh, every now and again, and it's always a great pleasure when I have to work with Louise. Her humor comes so effortless, you know, they think she just just stands up and says something, but it's deep concentration. She does a lot of hard work, very, very hard work. Television with all its hectic tensions and need for split-second timing, is one of the most formidable challenges to any artist. Like, um, this is nice. Everybody, who will put it on this tool, right at this line, yeah? Um, huh? You have a higher one? Miss Lou, well into her middle years, took on one of the most difficult types of programs to produce on television, an informal half-hour show with an audience and the cast of children. Each Saturday, while cameramen line up their shots and lighting is adjusted, Miss Lou works with her children in what looks like a scene of utter chaos.
Actually, of course, the technicians on the job are proceeding according to a plan. And Miss Lou, undisturbed by the movements and the noise of the studio crew, the bedlam of voices on intercoms and from the floor, serenely rehearses her little singers, dancers and actors. Tape Rolling Studio. Stand by. To an onlooker, it seems impossible Five, that order will come out four, of this chaos. Three, but performance two, time is near one. and the on show clap. goes on. Coming up on two, stand them by. Cue them. Um, she gets um, better all the time. I think that she's always improving and that is one great thing about being a performer, to be able to keep up with the times and to be doing uh, fine all the time. Every time she goes on stage, she's ready with a nice, beautiful act. And then it's all over until next week, same time, same place. Yes, um, all in all, I would say that Louise is a terrific person. Uh, I don't type, come along, comes along. Um, uh, once in a century, and some can only hope that Louise will um, stick around for a long time because a long time before we see so brilliant a performer as Louise. The people of Jamaica express their love and affection for her in many ways. These were only a few of the many citations from Jamaican organizations. Another tribute to Miss Lou was the naming of the Garden Theatre at Jamaica House, scene of many theatrical triumphs in her honour. And in London, the editors of the International Who's Who in Poetry acclaimed her for distinguished contributions to poetry. The Medal of the British Empire was awarded to Miss Lou by Elizabeth II with this citation. To our trusty and well-beloved Louise Bennett Coverley, whereas we have thought fit to nominate and appoint you to be an ordinary member of the civil division of our said most excellent order of the British Empire, given at our court of St. James under our sign this 11th day of June, 1960, in the ninth year of our reign. Miss Lou was awarded two Musgrove medals by the Institute of Jamaica for her cultural contributions to Jamaican life. First, the Silver Musgrave Medal. Next, the Gold Medal. The Norman Washington Manly Foundation 
takes great pleasure in declaring Louise Bennett Coverley. All Jamaica agreed that when the award was to be given in the field of the arts, there was no other possible choice than Louise Bennett Coverley. The recipient of the Norman Manley Award for Excellence for the year 1972. Writer and performer, Louise Bennett has exhibited an unswerving commitment to her art and to Jamaica. Her artistic effort has been sustained over some 30 years. Her distinguished eminence has in recent times been widely recognized, and her achievements of unique originality and permanent value are distinctly relevant to the advancement of Jamaica. The greatest distinction of all, the Order of Jamaica, was presented to Miss Lou by a grateful nation. The Order of Jamaica, to be worn with pride by the Honorable Louise Bennett Coven. I have lived to see such a lot of her good things that I would have loved to have happened to me maybe when I was a child. I wanted so much that to, 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 to have Nancy stories in the school. I know my grandmother used to tell me the stories, but, but, and, and we used to tell the stories too, but somehow it was, it didn't have the blessing of, of the educational system. And now I've lived to see that, that this is a part now. It's our life. Our children now can feel proud and happy about the things that really belong to them. Because I know that we have a wonderful heritage. Such a lot of nice things have been left to us from, from the people who went before. They left us a language. They left us they, they lovely, the proverbs uh, and such, and the songs and the stories. And uh, oh, well, I'm very happy about all of that. <laughs> so a lot of things that that I thought I'd never see, that that would never happen, have happened. I have always said that I never asked for much, but I've had a great deal, great deal. In the island of Jamaica, there were lots of little towns, and lots of little districts, and villages around. The funniest thing about them, the names they call them by, Constitution Hill, Matala, Kinor, Gonfrong. 